Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, this is the session of Storyteller Tactics, Ask the Author, which is dedicated to customer stories. Um, so for those watching the recording, we have a very special guest with us today called Kerry Thompson. Kerry gives all a wave. Okay. Hello. And Kerry's, Kerry has kindly volunteered to be a guinea pig. And she's going to share, she has shared with me already the kind of customer stories she's telling about working in the automotive industry, working with car sellers who are trying to sell cars to, to you and me. Um, and what Kerry's agreed to do is share with us the before and after. So what we've got at the moment are this, the kind of customer stories, the kind of case studies she's writing at the moment. We're going to take them apart, be very critical, um, and use storyteller tactics to help her put them back together again. And at the end of it, um, Kerry will share with us the new versions of the stories that she she's able to tell, um, the new version of the customer stories. So hopefully, yeah, fingers crossed, we will see a big improvement. Uh, so what, unless, as I said, if you have any questions, comments as we go through, please put them in the chat and, and Bryony will keep an eye out for them and interrupt me if needs be. Yeah. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to go to screen share and I'm going to walk you through the, I'm going to walk you through. Okay. So I am going to walk you through the, so hopefully you can all see me. Um, and this is the, the uh, some frame grabs from the current Akeno website. And it's looking at a case study of Seat, the car dealer, and their stores. Um, now, what I'd suggest is you don't try and read all of this at once because then you won't be listening to me. But the link is here on this post-it here. Okay. So you can actually go to the existing website and read this a little, a little bit more at your leisure rather than trying to read it while I'm talking. Okay. Um, so we have some interesting... Kerry, do you want to just very quickly tell us the, the kind of the headline version of, of what it sure. is they at in this case? Sure. So basically, this was a, a grand idea that Sayat headquarters in Barcelona had, which was to, rather than bringing people into a car dealership, it was to basically take the car dealership to where the people were. And in this case, it was shopping centres. So first of all, Lakeside in Essex in the UK, and then Westfield White City in London in the UK as well. So in, very quickly, in terms of the, the support that I and my team did, um, at the point of, of me entering, they'd gone into the transformation thinking only about the computer system that would underpin it all. Um, and my job was basically to go in and to think about the operational realities of making this store work. So it was basically um, an, an empty box in a shopping center was going to be fitted out by some very clever builders. There's going to be some very clever technical people building a, a pretty system for people to use when they went into the store to self-serve. And my job was to do everything else and bring it all together in order to make an operational store. So if you were basically to, to, to kind of give the, the, the in a nutshell summary, it's taking a car dealership that normally lives out there in a you know industrial estate somewhere or by the side of a main road and putting mm -hmm. it in a shopping centre. Correct, yes. And the and a key premise for all of this as well, just in case it becomes pertinent in the, uh, in the example today, is that this wasn't about putting a dealership in a shopping centre. Actually, it was about having a different customer experience as well. So actually, that when you went in, it was much more akin to the Apple store type experience. Okay. So rather than being sold heavily to. So yes, my job was to make all of that, that reality. So taking the factory in Barcelona's vision, headquarters vision, and then basically making it a reality with a customer experience that worked in a positive way. I'm going to start looking at the actual wording of the the, the website now. That the the this is so this is the this page we're looking at here on on yes. is from it's called case studies and it's the the lead case study, and so there are these hey, things Steve, here. Sorry to interrupt. Can I just quickly get um everyone give me a thumbs up on the chat if you can hear Steve? We've had a couple of comments say that your mic volume is a bit low, Steve. Um, I can hear you completely fine. Um, but we've had a few people say that it's quite soft and quite quiet. Okay. Kerry, can you hear Steve okay? I, yes, I can hear fine, yes. I'm just checking. I'm should I should be on this. Uh, I'll tell you what, I'll I'll I'll, I'll um I'll speak up even louder. Um Yeah, I, I think I think overall it's it's fine. I, it may just be a couple of um connections where Thank you. I'll, I'll I'll try and keep it nice and <clears throat> <laughs> thank you. Okay, I'll go for my uh, on-stage voice. <laughs> okay, so a couple of interesting things as we look down this 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 case study. Um, well, first of all, there's a little bit of of 
assuming what the audience knows. So here, for example, omni-channel car sales. So you say the concept of omni-channel car sales was highly new and innovative, largely untested. So this is basically what Kerry's explained to us as the idea of not just taking a car dealership and putting it in a shopping center, but actually making it more like a, you know, an Apple store experience. Now, here I've put a little note on the side of the page here, which says, well, this kind of assumes that the audience knows what omnichannel sales means. Now, I didn't, and probably a lot of you on the call didn't, but that's not really the point. The point here is the audience who Kerry is writing for probably does, because she's sending these case studies to people in the automotive industry. So she's writing for an audience who kind of knows what an omnichannel sales experience means. Having said that, even when that's the case, if you're going to use a piece of jargon like that, okay, most 95% of your audience know, know what it means, but maybe there's 5% who don't. So maybe it doesn't hurt to, to find a way of saying it that your mum would recognise instantly and go, oh, so you mean they're putting a like a, they're turning an apple store and making oh okay oh yeah i get that okay I, so it might be worth thinking about who your audience is like i say in this instance carrie i'd be right in assuming the majority of the people who you think will read this website they know what that means yes yes you're right it's then some industry buzzwords that are, are sort of commonplace at the moment so yes you're right but really good point well it's it's, it's interesting when there are industry buzzwords quite often it's you it's worth using them because part of the reason why you use them is you're demonstrating you belong in that crowd of people especially if you know what you're talking about when you use them the nightmare is when you use a buzzword that you don't understand well that's a disaster you're just waiting for trouble there uh, but okay in this instance the audience knows having said that it doesn't hurt to get a really neat as you did in the conversation kerry you're talking to all of us and he said, basically, it's like an Apple store for cars. And everyone goes, oh, OK, so that doesn't hurt to, you know, to, to do that as well. OK, so then we go down and there, as we go down the text, what I noticed here is, as you read the pink notes, there are a couple of potential movie moments in this copy. So it's not all bad. Um, so, for example, great line here. If you've ever tried visiting a busy shopping centre like Lakeside at Christmas time, you'll know what a challenge it is to get one car in, never mind an 11-car transporter. So that's a nice little movie moment, because, yeah, I've tried to drive into a shopping centre at Christmas time. It's a nightmare. Wow, imagine going in with a... OK, so it works as a little movie, because I can see what Kerry means. OK, whereas, yeah, new and improved customer experience, I can't see what that means. That's just words. OK, equally... There's another little potential movie moment here when you had to use an industrial crane to lift vehicles up onto the first front of the first level. OK, so again, straight away, I'm seeing something in my head. You've given me a moment. Yep. Oh, Pontus, be careful not to move. I actually need to lock these in place. Hold on a second. Um, be careful not to move stuff around on the on the Miro. Um, let me just lock that. Uh, OK, so you can see there's even in this copy, which I'll be honest, I'm afraid isn't great. Um, because it's very clunky and, and kind of long-winded. Even here, there are still potential movie moments. Now, you get onto the next page, the second page, of the, and there are zero movie moments here. Okay. Why? Well, because we're talking about abstracts. We're talking about operational business processes. Well, what does that look like? It's an abstract concept. Um, so we're talking about, and, and the word count gets longer, the paragraphs get longer, the words get longer. Um, OK, we start getting into plurals. It's an interesting thing. You can't have a movie about plurals. So the stores had a whole new set of needs and challenges. That's OK. What do needs and challenges look like? Well, you don't know because it's plural. Give me one need or one challenge. Yeah. One challenge we had was we had to get cars onto the first floor with no ramp. That's a challenge. Therefore, and I can see it because I can see a first floor and I can see no ramp. Therefore, we used a crane. Oh, I see what you mean. So suddenly the challenge goes from needs and challenges, which I cannot see what that means. There's no image in my head. There's no movie playing when you say that. So all of these paragraphs you've got here on the second page, as I read them, there is no movie playing in my head all the way down and the same goes on to the bullet points at the end um you know 
all of these are abstracts. There is no movie playing at all. Um, okay. So managing user acceptance, testing of consumer of customer facing systems to ensure an intuitive and accurate user experience. <gasps> right. Here's an interesting thing. Little little test for people, which I sometimes use with is like, okay, when you're not sure, right? Think of the mum on the phone test. Right. And the mum on the phone test goes like this. Yeah. And the mum like you get to the end of the working day, Kerry, you go home, a nice long day, phone rings. And it's your mum. And she says, hey, how are you doing, love? How are you doing, Kerry? And you go, oh, fantastic. It's such a great day, mum. And she goes, oh, what happened? And you go, well, I managed mm -hmm. the acceptance testing of customer-facing systems and ensured an intuitive and accurate user experience. And your mum goes. It rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? It's fantastic. <laughs> oh, that sounds nice, dear. Right. So it fails the mum on the phone test because yeah. she wouldn't say it in conversation. Um, I'm not saying, by the way, I got called out on this recently. I am not saying that mums are stupid. What I am saying is mums are far too clever to listen to that bullshit. <laughs> okay, so the rest of the page fails the movie time test. So let's just recap very quickly before we kind of go into the customer story. What is the movie time test? Well, the movie time tactic is one of the kind of the most used tactics in storyteller tactics. And it says essentially, if you want me to if you're telling a story, it starts a movie playing in my head. And the three ingredients of the story, right? Number one, action. We are in a location. Where are we? What's happening? What happens next? There, are, yeah, There's a real time, real place, real moment that you could actually point a camera at. Yeah. We're lifting cars with a crane. Yeah. Each car's £40,000 worth of car. And we're lifting it above a multi-million pound shopping centre and gently dropping it down onto a multi-thousand pound yeah, piece of flooring with a crane. Right? There's your action. So straight away, I see what you mean. The next ingredient of a movie in movie time, the next ingredient of a story is emotion. Who's involved? What's at stake? How does it feel? So, Kerry, when you were, were you there watching the crane? I was, yes. Yeah. How did it feel? Um, it was... Lots of trepidation because exactly you, you painted the picture absolutely correct. And in addition to that, is it had to get very close to another shop window, which would have gone smash if it had been in the wrong position. So yes, if that had if the swing had been too great, then it would have taken out Zara's window, the clothes shop. And she would not she would not have been happy. So there's a no. lot at stake. And you know, obviously the public weren't there because you wouldn't let the public in when you're doing that. But... No, no, this was at about three o'clock in the morning, correct. Oh, but that's the movie's getting better. So three o'clock in the yes. morning. Old. What time of year was it? Um, where were we? Well, it was summertime, so it was summertime. But this is three o'clock in the morning, kind of avoiding the drunk people that are navigating past the outdoor of the shopping centre. The mm. uh, the car has turned up very pretty and all uh, prepared on the on a covered transporter, all nice and sparkly, and of course has to get pushed or from the uh, from the transporter has to get put into these skate type items. In order to get pushed up a ramp, in order to meet the crane chaps, so they could connect the crane up in yeah. the dark, avoiding drunk people. Okay, and then they hoist this 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 car worth fifty, sixty thousand pounds. They hoist yes. it in the air. They swing it through the air, through the night sky. They swing it down into the 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 space that's been carefully prepared, which presumably somebody's opened the roof for you. Well, it's, um, there was just so people can picture it. It's the frontage of the shopping centre was, was allowed us to be able to get into the shopping centre. So the crane then has to be built inside the shopping centre. Okay. And then so you've got all these facets of um, obviously of, of handoff between who does what. The car then lifted from the ground floor onto the first floor, put back onto its skates and pushed around the shopping centre to the store location to be put into position and then someone scurries in with all of the relevant cleaning materials to make it all polished and shiny again oh, absolutely right okay so i'm just, just um okay so so okay there's an awful lot going on so it's, a, yes. it's three o'clock in the morning on a summer's morning and and you should be in bed and okay the, the, there's the movie the emotion trepidation excitement and when yes. it's pride hey look what we've just done okay so there's your there's the there's the guts of your story, the action and the emotion. That's what you need to get the movie running in our heads. And so hopefully everyone listening, yeah, we were we 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 weren't there, but we now can see it. And because Kerry is explaining, they're sort of 
Yeah, we can feel it. So that's amazing. We're now we weren't there, but we can see what she's talking about and we can we know how it feels. Wow, fantastic. We are connected. That's how you set the scene with a movie, action and emotion. And then you get to give us the meaning. Right. And if you were to say, Kerry, what do you think the moral of this story is from your point of view? This you've told us a little movie moments about lifting a what's the moral of the story? What should we think about you now as a result? Uh, well, as a result of that, it was my 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 processes, my work. So, so the element of the case study, which sounded very dull because it talked about operational processes, actually it was all of my groundwork to define those operational processes to work out how we get the, the vehicle from the cover transporter to the entry point, handed over to the crane guys, handed handed back over to the uh, to the, the transporter guys. So basically, it was the it was my my preparation and and, and all organisation. And having all of those handover points agreed and documented and, and approved and signed off that in that moment, three o'clock in the morning, in the dark, it worked. Mm. So that was the, the, the moral. Interesting to know in the chat if people want to share their 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 take. You know, what what do they what do people read about you from this story? Because I read mm -hmm. safe pair of hands. Yeah. So, okay, so anyway, this is how the story, this is how the most basic level of storytelling works. You've got to get a movie running. And when you've got the movie running, then you can give us the meaning. Then you can talk to us about it. So, so what I think this shows is, da, 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 da. When we take on a project, yep, it goes like this. That's the meaning of the story. So this is when I say operational, what was it? Working with on-site contractors to manage the physical construction of the store and its, and its internal fittings. When I say that, what I mean is I'm standing there at three o'clock in the morning with a hard hat on. Right. OK, so now you've you've passed the mum on the phone test. What did you do today at work, love? Oh, you won't believe I had this amazing morning. I stood there. Right. OK, you're now telling a story. So that's the first thing. There are potential movie moments in this story. Great. Fantastic. What you could also do is think, well, OK, there are also look some of this stuff on the second page where there's zero movies. Right. Well, some of this stuff, like managing user acceptance, testing of customer facing systems. This stuff is important. Right. It is important. It's how you, you know, OK. So what I need to do, what Kerry needs to do is think, OK, I've got something important to say here. I've got to find a movie moment to say it. So I've got to find, yep, a thing that we did a person who we helped, a moment in time. So maybe it was the moment when the first customer walked in. Yeah. And I don't know what they did. They maybe they 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 did a color change thing on an iPad so they could color change the car and say, I don't like red, I want green. Yeah. Or whatever it was. So, you know, there was something that a customer did for the first time and went, oh, I like this. And that came from yeah, a long process of important stuff that Kerry did, but the movie. OK, so first, the first thing we're doing is basically trying to movify um, this this case study to make it jump off the page in a way that we will remember it. OK, so we're trying to get, make, get some movie. Now, that's the kind of basic of storytelling. However, the other important thing about this, OK, you can give us a case study, which you say so you can rewrite this case study to say at stores and movify it. Yeah, you could even open on, it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm standing with a hard hat watching 50,000 pounds worth of car hovering, you know, whatever. You could, you could, so whatever, mm -hmm. you, you, you can movify the, the, the actual, but what's important with sales stories is the person you're talking about, the customer you're talking about. So in the card, in the tactic, simple sales stories, um, you're trying to convince with this story you're trying to convince a new customer to buy your product or your service or your expertise by telling them a story about an existing customer. And this is the simplest, this is what I call simple sales stories. This is the simplest version of storytelling we know. Like someone like you buys this product, or in Kerry's case, someone like you buys this service from us. Okay. Now, Clearly, because Kerry, you're you're dealing almost entirely at the moment with automotive. Other, so you listed them before we started recording: VW, Seat, Volvo, Audi, Jaguar Land Rover. Yes. Okay. 
Okay, so the first version is you're basically saying the simple sales story is right. Someone like you, so you're going to a new a new car dealer. You're going to Hyundai. We've worked with, you know, you can list them. All these mm -hmm. people, you know, people like you. They so you do this anyway. Um, moral of the story: we've solved their problem. We can solve yours too. Okay, so the key thing here is to, and you do this already. You identify who you're trying to sell to who you already helped who's like them or had a, pr a similar problem to them. So you could start thinking, well, we could actually branch out. You know, We've done omni-channel sales for car industry. Maybe we could start doing omni-channel sales for, I don't know, holiday lets or you know, something else where they've got a similar prob, different market, but they've got a similar problem. Okay, so we could say, hey, We've not worked with you before, but we have worked with people who try to solve your problem. Okay, so either way, this is probably the most common sales story that any of us are doing is, hey, someone like you buys this already. Uh, what's really interesting, Kerry, I don't know how you got started in this in this sector in the first place, but when you when I talk to people who are who I mean, I started my business as, as a consultant eight, nine years ago. And when I started, I didn't have any customers to I, the, who I could say, I've worked with someone like you. And therefore, you end up giving away your some of your time and effort for free. So you give people little samples. So in my case, I'd run a, a, a taster workshop for 45 minutes. Um, and, I, and I would do that in order that I could say, hey, I've done a workshop for Bentley Motors. Um, and I could say that to another company. Okay, so it's it's this when you're very at the very I don't know if, if anybody on the call is at the very very early stages of a business. We can come on to this when we come to questions later. Um, but if you're at the very very early stage of trading in your business, you don't have any simple sales stories yet. So what you actually end up doing is you're giving away some product or some service or some time of yours for free. And what you're doing is you're getting back the right to tell a story about it. And that story is going to be worth something to you. Okay. So the simple sales story is someone like you buys this product. Now, what's interesting here, what's happening here? What's interesting here is there are three kinds of people you can tell stories about. And I've, I've, I've given Kerry a bit of forewarning for this. So she's got some ideas prepared. So the three are old, regular, and tricky customers. And the moral of these stories is these people like us, we must be doing something right. So the three go, okay, old customer, we sold something yeah, to this guy 10 years ago, and it still works. A regular customer is, well, she bought something from us, and she keeps coming back for more. The interesting thing here is if you're a good salesperson, you can sell any shit once to somebody, but you can't sell crap twice to the same person. So the fact that somebody keeps coming back for more, yeah, is proof. It doesn't prove anything, but it feels like proof that you're doing a good job. So your old customers where, look, I bought this from you 10 years ago. It still works. That's proof that something is good. Somebody keeps coming back for more. That feels like proof that you're good. The final category is tricky customers where somebody can, you tried something, it didn't work. It failed. They complained. But you put it right. So, Kerry, do you have an example that of that you're going to go for with your, your case studies now of an old customer, of somebody who you've worked with a long time ago, but they're still doing the thing you told them to do? Yes, I can. So uh, just give some context to this one. This is a Volkswagen Group. Um, so the, the, a group of, of, um, of manufacturers, which is Audi, Volkswagen, Skoda, Seat and Volkswagen commercial vehicles, just for context. Um, and so almost a decade ago now, I was um, I came in and did a piece of work on again, it was an operational processes piece of work to document operational processes in the business. Um, which were needed for new starters when new people came into role, but also for audit purposes mm. and actually for Germanic audit, audit purposes. And if anyone's ever worked in this world, the best auditors in the world, in my opinion, are Germans because they are genuinely very 
you know, very um, big on the detail. So yes, so that's a piece of work that I did 10 years ago, and I'm actually currently back working with Volkswagen Group on a different project, albeit, but those processes and that ways of working are still in use almost right. a decade later. Is the right, right. Okay, so what you need in this story, and I'm just going to make some very quick notes, is, is exactly this line. You need these processes are still in use almost a decade later. Right. That's the line you need in that story. You yes. Can say it. Yeah. You know, it's fine. You can say it. it's true. Even better if somebody from VW says it. Yes. Right. Okay. Because if you were making pizza, you would say, this is the best pizza in South London. I'd expect you to say that. Mm -hmm. the customer says, this is the best pizza in South London. Oh, okay. So the, somebody from the VW group who you worked with 10 years ago needs to say to you, the work you did with us was great 10 years ago, and a decade later, we're still using the things that you gave us. Right. Because you can't buy time. Just for everyone else who's, who's thinking about this. If you're promising that a product you make or a service you provide will stand the test of time, you're promising something about the future, and it's just a promise. And the only option we've got is to believe you or not believe you, right? You can't prove anything about the future at all because it's, it's in the future. But you can point backwards and say, look at that one. We Look at that house we built 20 years ago. It's still standing. It's in good condition. That is feels like proof looking back in the future looking back into the past feels like proof looking into the future feels like a promise because it is a promise so if you can go look at that what we did 10 years ago fantastic so old customer really important okay next one would be regular customer so somebody buys from you once kerry and they kept yes. back for more they did so the example here is volvo uk and um volvo uk they commissioned from me a very small piece of work. It's about a 10-day piece of work um, back in, where were we now, 2018. And they regularly call me back in to do additional pieces of work as well. So whenever there's a need or a requirement, um, they will now proactively reach out to me to see if it's something suitable that I and my team can help with. Okay, so again, um, what you need here in this, this simple sales story is we regularly... We regularly go back to Kerry whenever we need XXX, whatever it is they need. Right. So again, that quote sounds good coming from you, sounds better coming from them. Yes. Okay, very good. Next stage would be, okay, well, what's the, you know, finally, tricky customer. Now, this is, so the tricky customer is, we we got the job we got the contract we went in we all guns blazing uh huh, huh. and then it all went a bit you know all went a bit off the rails but we fixed it so do you have a, an example of those tricky customers? i do yes so this is the volvo one again but volvo headquarters based in sweden so this was again a piece of work that we were commissioned to do um and we we delivered it and we handed it back and, and everyone was really happy and then two months later, we get some contact from them, which was actually, this isn't quite what we needed after all. Um, can we revisit it? Can we do some additional work? Mm. So it was it was tricky because the, the, the brief had been delivered. Um, and actually, again, just for context, so people can, understand, can hear this actually, is that part of the confusion was because the workshops that we did in person in the UK were attended remotely by a couple of people from Sweden. And what they said to us two months after delivery was that connection wasn't great. And actually they didn't, so they actually missed some of the workshop because the Wi-Fi connection in their office wasn't great, but that wasn't raised at the time. So therefore the, the delivery was in good faith with everyone in the room and everyone agreed it was what was needed. Um, but yes. How did you make it good? Um, so basically it was a, it was conversation. It was just some some honest conversation that said, you know, we we demonstrated the brief. We talked through the discussions that are held in the workshop. So we provided the evidence that we believed satisfied the fact that we had delivered. But equally, we didn't want to leave them with a gap. It wasn't a huge amount of work that needed to be done. So then what we did, we then agreed to then bridge the gap that they they believed was needed. So, yes, we did some additional work. 
Um, but from our side, it wasn't a huge amount of effort. And we wanted to, to leave that relationship in, a, in good stead for future pieces of work, which it, it has been left that way. Okay. And again, the quote you're looking for in this story, not from you, but from somebody in Volvo, um, how would you say that left Volvo HQ feeling about working with you? Um, I think they, they just felt that there was, a, a, again, using that word again, but there was an, an honest, um, you know, an honest approach and that we would do everything that we could to rectify it so that we were flexible. Okay. And it was all about the, the client satisfaction. Yep, to make us happy in the end. Okay, so again, so what we've got here are three, essentially three stories. Um, and they're all kind of heading, you know, so old customer, regular customer, vol, um, uh, tricky customer. Yeah. So these are three categories of, of, of customer stories that you can tell. And what you're looking for in all of them, well, clearly you're looking for, yeah, a kind of making sure each one has a little movie time moment. That's the first thing. So yeah, what actually happened? What actually did you do? So that's the first thing. But the second thing is you're kind of looking for direct quotes right so air quote you know people actually saying stuff about you yeah so you know somebody from volvo uk saying well now we regularly go back to kerry whenever we need help to run a workshop in xyz we regularly go back to kerry in quotes and there's a reason why it's good to have things in quotes if you look at this this card here i use direct direct quotes on the card um, that I use them all, you know. And one thing it does is it breaks up the flow of copy, right? It, so you've got a bunch of text in front of you. Direct quotes breaks it up, right? So it's easier to read. That's the first thing. Second thing, direct quotes tend to be conversational because people don't say um, Kerry was, uh, Kerry managed uh, user acceptance testing of customer facing systems to ensure an intuitive and you know people don't say that stuff in you know they might write it but they don't say it so if you, when you're going for for direct quotes you're getting much more conversational and the third and final reason why it's really good to use direct quotes in copy is that when we read direct quotes we kind of role play the part of the person speaking slightly strange thing to, but it's true we sort of role play their their voice and that means we're getting into your story because we're imagining being the person saying that so it's a little trick that gets people even deeper into your story you've already given them a, a lovely movie yeah you've given them some action you've given them some emotion now you're giving them a human another person talking and they are going to get into that so it's Clever, it works. Okay, um, so I'm going to do one last look at a, a, one last kind of technique to to. A, 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 okay, we know what we need. And then I'll I'll throw open to questions from from other people. So now we know what we need. Okay, we need simple sales stories about real customers. We need old, regular, and tricky customers. We need them, yeah, to play to start a little movie playing for us. So we need simple sales stories, and we need movie time. The last card we're going to look at is, is one called social proof. And the reason why, so social, I won't go into what social proof is, but on the card, it talks about testimonials are uh, fantastic. Okay, so I'll just quickly go through. So five-star reviews that you get on Trustpilot are great, but testimonials are better. But the trouble is we don't like asking for them, right? So what, and also people tend to write things, bland stuff like, Oh, they were they did good service. Well, that's no good. So you have to ask these questions. Was there one thing you really liked about the way we did that workshop? Was there one moment when you thought, yeah, I made the right decision here? What would you actually say to persuade someone else in Volvo to work with us? So these are actual questions. Now, I haven't been as clear on this this card as I could be on I said we'll try asking these questions what I mean by this is so Kerry you know there's somebody for each of these these three stories mm -hmm. you've identified there's a person yep there's a person behind each of these three stories who you need to ring up 
right? So the first challenge here for social credit is who are you going to call? So you actually have to work out, Kerry, you're going to call three people. Okay. Then you are going to have, you're going to explain why you're calling. Obviously, I'm right. I'm calling because look, I need to. I need some case studies for our website. It would really help me. Can I take ten minutes just for a chat? So you have the chat, and you ask these questions. What did you really like? Was there one moment when? Yeah. And then you, Kerry, not them. You write it up. So you write up the conversation. You write up the direct quotes from. Your, your contact at Volvo. Okay. You then send it back to them for approval. And at this point, when they say yes, you ask for a photograph. Because social proof and, you know, social stories, we, it's great if we can see the person who's telling us these amazing things about you. So their LinkedIn profile picture, for example. You put the two together. So we have a picture of the person in Volvo. We have the direct quote saying, whenever we need a workshop like this, we always go back to Kerry now. So we have a photograph. Is it a man or a woman at Volvo UK? The Volvo UK one, that, what, that was the, uh, that's a, that's a woman, that one. Yep. Okay, so what's she called? Lex, her name is. Okay, so we have a picture of Lex, yep. And we have a direct quote in inverted commas from Lex saying roughly, Whenever we need a workshop like this, we go. We always go to Kerry first. End quote. And that then is on. Yep, is on your case studies. So instead of it just being lots and lots of text, we actually have a picture of Lex, or you, or you go back to the guys at Sayat in this case. Yep, um, we actually have a picture of the the your contact at Sayat saying mm -hmm. we'd never tried this before. Yeah. And the level of attention to detail Kerry gave was was fantastic. That's what you need. But you have to make it happen. You cannot expect other people to do this for you. If you if you were to email Lex at, v, at Volvo and say, hey, Lex, would you write? Could you write me a testimonial? She'll go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then just forget about it. Or she'll go, yeah, yeah. And she'll go really good service. Send. And it's next to useless next to useless the reason why she why she'll only do that is because she's busy right and you cannot ask her to write your story for you that's like getting her to do your homework it's your homework it's your story so you have the chat you you write it and then you send it to her for her to check it and if she doesn't like it you change it and if she does like it you post it right so it's actually it's 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 quite a lot of hard work, and I, I I think when I when I wrote this card about testimonial, I I I could have been a bit more uh, specific and said okay this this actually involves quite a bit of hard work, folks. Anyway, there you go. Um, so, Kerry, I'm going to ask you a couple of quick last questions, and then we'll throw up sure. questions. So, do you have a little plan of action now? I do indeed. And I guess what I should say as well is that I think I've got some really great people that I can go back to. So there's there's no excuse for me not to do my homework. Yes. And it is your homework. It's not theirs. Correct. Absolutely right. Here's an interesting thing as well. Um, I don't know who your suppliers are in the in your industry, but it'd be interesting if you think about who supplies you. Yeah, where you where mm -hmm. you are their client. And have you written a testimonial for any of them? And I'll I'll bet the answer is no. You see, I'm I'm pretty good at, at offering testimonials, um, and I think because it's one of these things where I understand the value of them. I've just been, as I, as I mentioned yesterday when we chatted, uh, Steve, is that I have just been super stuck as to where to start in order to a ask for, for my own. Because you're right, it's it's not knowing what to ask for. Can you write me a testimonial, please? It's just too empty. It's not descriptive enough. Um, and then if if you do, and I've got some great quotes back from people over the years, but then it's like, what do I do with them? How do I shape this into something which is engaging? So I think the the flow, so let's take the Sayat store example. Um, the flow is, give us a movie. Yep, there's a crane at three o'clock in the morning winching a car into a multi-million pound. This could be a disaster, right? So give us a give us a story, then give us a testimonial. And that's your one, two, bang. And then if, you know, so you go story, testimonial, I can help you too. Call to action. Yeah. Right. Bang, bang, bang. 
Here's the other thing as well, which I think will be really interesting. When you write it like that, story, yep, testimonial, call to action, I bet when you run it through a readability checker, your reading age will come down because writing like that is more conversational and less formal. And therefore, the reading age comes down, down, down till you end up writing. Instead of at the moment, your, your readability age is, I would say, 18 to 21 years old. Um, you want to be writing, I think, the 14, 12 to 14 year old, year old reading age, not because you're writing for 12 to 14 year olds, but because you're writing for busy people. Mm -hmm. and, and chances are, yeah, chances are people are reading it on a screen this big. So if you're writing really long paragraphs with really long words and really long sentences, it's getting lost in the scroll. Okay. Okay. So listen, I'm going to throw open now. Bryony, are there any any um questions? So throw open to anyone to either ask questions, certainly of me, but also of Kerry too, if you don't mind, Kerry. Of course, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, no questions at the moment. So yeah, please shoot questions into the chat box and we'll get those out comments on the chat let me see if i can open up the chat any comments on the chat other than about the volume of the microphone nothing so far okay uh okay 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 that's good well okay so um so open to folks then on the uh, on the rest of the call um do you have any questions about your own customer stories uh, or even examples you'd like to share from your own customer stories i'll tell you what, let me stop sharing Kerry's story. And Kerry, as I said before, has very kindly promised to um, come back to us when she's done her homework. So we can actually post side by side. So we can see the Sayat story as it was before. And then we can see the new version with the movies added and the testimonials added. And you can and then you can make a judgment yourselves, guys, as to whether or not you think it's um, a big improvement. Okay, so does anyone want to ask about um, so there's what there's one quick question here regarding um, recording of the testimonials and whether it's a good idea to um, record the call so that you can better get better direct quotes from. Yeah, I would say I would say obviously with the person's consent, absolutely fine. You shouldn't record people without their consent if they're happy to do that. Yes, um, I think the only the only drawback with recording calls um, is. Say you chat to somebody for 20 minutes, you're going to have to then spend 20 minutes listening to the, to the recording. If you sit there writing, I mean, it's, all, it's entirely up to you. If you sit there writing little notes, they'll say, they'll say one thing that really jumps out at you. And then you'll write that down. Um, and then you put a circle around it. And so I think there's a filtering process of editing as you, as you talk, just from writing. Um, and maybe there's a, an additional value in recording it just in case you missed something and listening back to it. Yeah. As long as the other person's happy, that's absolutely fine. Um, I appreciate you don't, all, it's not always easy because sometimes you'll deal with people who don't want to be quoted because they work inside a large organization and they don't want to be the person who ends up like the spokesman for Apple product. Mm -hmm. can't, so, so fair enough. Um, you know, in that case, you can't always get people to, to do it. I appreciate that. Um, are raw videos of customers better? Oh, now then, Josh, good question. So, um, you, it's very, very interesting. Um, I think video, video has a plus and a, and a, and a minus um, to it, a positive and a negative. The positive is you really do see the person. So imagine Kerry ends up recording a Zoom chat, her and Lex, and they they chat for ten minutes about the work that. Kerry's done for Lex and how much Lex values it. And if you were listening to that, you'd be really engaged by it. Okay. But it's 10 minutes long. And maybe the really, the really killer quote is eight minutes into the 10. And unless I'm really, really committed to investigating Kerry's business, I'm not going to listen to eight minutes of video in the hope that I'll find a juicy little bit. Um, Whereas a 10 word written quote, I can read that in two seconds. So it's delivering incredibly quickly, whereas video, video takes longer. Um, so, okay. 
it was like you know look the, the video can really take you to a place it can really immerse you um it's a question of have you got time so if you know if you, you know what happens somebody comes back from somebody comes back from their honeymoon in tahiti and says would you like to see my wedding video and you go mm. oh. <laughs> mm. right. someone comes back from their wedding and honeymoon and says would you like to see five of my best photographs from tahiti you'll go yeah go on of course i will but they say would you like to watch my wedding video just as a, um, as, a, as a tip, what I've done is uh, another another part of my business, a smaller part we're not looking at today, is um, I do career coaching. And so I did some coaching of a 17-year-old young young chap who was very, very engaged and we had some great outcomes from the coaching. So what I've got is I've got a, a creative lady who does some work for me. So she did a, a Zoom interview with some, I say scripted, but some pre-planned questions that she sent to him just so he could think about it. And then what she's doing at the moment, actually, as we speak, is she's then just chopping up that video into small bite-sized chunks with some of the... So, I, so we're going to use both mediums, actually. We're going to use extracting some of the killer quotes, but also just doing a little, a few punchy um, punchy videos to be able to put out on, on social media as well. If, if you have time to do that, fantastic. Um, it does require time. It does require... Yes. Um, if you've got time to do it. What I would say is, okay, as a little tip as a journalist, former TV journalist who did an awful lot of recording um, of, you know, talk to people first with a notebook only, right? Don't just record everything. Just talk to them first with a notebook and then say, look, I'm gonna, I'd like to record this bit. Are you okay with that? I just want to talk about this bit we said at the end. Yep. So you've done the editing in your head. You've done the editing on paper. And then you go back and say, look, just if I record us now, can you tell me that bit again? Let's talk about that bit there. And then you're getting it in 90 seconds. Mm. And you know it's good because you've already chatted through it. Um, yeah. But video yeah, is a great, great tip. Yeah. Video is an interesting medium to work in. What I discovered as a as a journalist interviewing people was it's it's quite high pressure because the minute the camera starts recording, they tense up. What was nine times out of ten, what would happen is you'd be filming somebody. Um, you switch the camera off. Camera guy would start to pack away, and the interview interviewee would go, "Oh, you, yeah, I'll tell you what." And then they tell you something amazing, and you'd go, "Right, okay." <laughs> well, get the camera back, okay. <laughs> and you'd switch. You'd have to switch back on again because they they'd relaxed enough to tell you the real story. Yeah. Um, video is video is is good, but difficult. Um, okay. Uh, but a bit of quick a little... okay, question from Rayshawn, I think it is. Um, while marketing may be scripting um, or wordsmithing, would you still recommend the customer facing sales rep to be the one to have the chat with and to gather quotes from? Ooh, um, yeah, almost yes, probably. I mean, I think as long as you know, if, the, if you if you have a good if that sales rep has has the relationship, um, yes. The only reason why somebody else maybe would have that conversation is. Because sometimes the sales, so if you, for example, you're a sales rep who's been dealing with a company now for like two years, backwards and forwards, yeah, you've got so much common ground. It's like, you know, when you go out with some old friends, you don't talk about why are you friends, right? You just know you are friends. If you've got a sales rep who's known somebody, a company for two years, constant, like, you know, positive, right? You forget to talk about why do we do business? So maybe you're somebody fresh coming in and saying, Hey, you know, tell us what, what 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 do you like about doing business with us? Okay, why do you choose us, even though we're we you know we're not the cheapest on the market? So sometimes a fresh voice can be useful, but you know, I would say yeah, it's it's a, the obvious person to get the quote is probably the sales rep, yes, who has the relationship. Um, yeah. Okay. Question, if I can, Steve, is um sorry, uh, Brian, it was a really, really quick one. I promise. Um, it was just I, was, I guess I was wondering just thinking out loud if you have come across any good examples or great examples of customer stories obviously i shall be doing doing my my homework but i guess just as some inspiration i suppose if you've come across any that you could share um let's throw that one out to the group as well if people yes yeah good show um yes but put on the spot i can't think what they are um Perhaps people could share them into the Slack channel if they come across them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think of um, oh. some of the clothing brands do do very well with the kind of you know this is what our real customers look like. Um, you know, Dove Dove um, 
quite a few years ago, Dove went for a kind of Dove, the cosmetics and soap brand. Dove went for real beauty, um, and they started using real women rather than rather than models. But they used real women as their model. They were the real customers. Um, look, there, there's a lot I, on on the spot. I can't think of one where I've gone. Wow, that's good. Um, no, sorry, on the spot, I can't think of one. But you know, there there are loads. Um, okay, let's have a look. So. Other questions. Is there a tutorial on best ways to use the tactics deck, John? Um, well, John, if, I don't know if you're still on the call. Um, we have, hello, John, hello. Um, we have blog sites on piptex.com. There's a blog site full of, we, we you know, we write up lots of tips. Um, we are, we haven't imagined ourselves as a sort of making a long kind of beginning to end tutorial. We might do that in the, in the, in the future. Um, We've got on the blog site, there's a there's a getting started blog, which is a kind of collection of lots of different posts. So there's one, for example, with a five day beginners program where you have five tasks for five days and we encourage you to do each one and see how you get on. Um, so, yeah. But if are you on the Slack channel already, John? The, OK, um, Brian, you've got a second. Could you post a link to the Slack channel into the chat? Um, what's great about the Slack channel, John, is if you come on there, is you you ask a question about, you know, I'm trying to write a customer story, but blah, blah, blah. Someone like me will answer it, one of the authors, but also lots of customers chip in with their ideas too. So it's a really strong self-help community. But at the moment, no, we don't have a kind of getting started. We've got a getting started blog post. Brian, if you, if you wouldn't mind if you can find the blog post for getting started and post that for John when you get a yeah. second. Um, so we have a, that. And yes. Okay. Um, okay. Quickly looking down. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Our rule video is better. We've done that. Um, um, there, was, there was a quick one about any recommendations on the readability grader. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll just quickly post the, so readability, if you just look at, if you, if you, um, Hemingway app and Grammarly I haven't used, but I'm, 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 I've heard they're very, very good. Um, if you use, uh, just type into Google readability checker, it'll give you a whole bunch of different ones. There's one I use called readability formulas, which is like an aggregator of all the different possible ways of checking your text. You cut and paste your text in, it spits it out with a, with a, a score. Um, things like Grammarly and Hemingway, I guess, also give you some tips on how to change your um, your writing to make it more readable. Um, as I say, I think, look, it's really kind, kind of shocking when you realise that the average reading age in a country like the UK or the US, the average reading age is about 12 years old. Um, and that's a bit of an eye opener. And a lot of people are writing copy for business with a reading age of fifth, of, of, of 21 and above. And okay, there's some very smart people out there in business, but they're busy, right? Okay. Um, but about a great point on comfort when on video. Okay, do you have any tips on how how to know the right amount of detail? <laughs> yes. Okay. Pontus is a great question. Pontus, are you still on the call? I don't know if, if you're still there. Um, it's a fantastic question. How much is too much? How much is not enough? Um, look, guys, there, there isn't. A, a hard and fast answer to that. Um, too much detail is when people start looking away, leaning back, checking their watch, checking their phone. Yeah, yeah. you're boring people if you too much detail. Uh, not enough is they're, they're going, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. So there's somewhere in the middle. It's about as scientific as that. Um, you know, the other thing as well is, you know, got a really good, I mean, the mum on the phone test is a, is a nice one. Um, but the other thing as well to think about is um, I, I had a very long chat with a customer the other day who was in, what was he doing? Financial selling, I think, finance, finance sales, real estate, real estate investing. And he told me a very long story and then got to the bit where he said, yeah, but I don't really tell people to do that anymore. What I tell them to do now is this. And I was like, well, why Why did you just tell me that really long story? So it has to have a point, and the point has to be useful to the person you're talking to. So it's that thing of, okay, 
so the question, right, long-winded answer to a short question. The short version, Pontus, is it's too long. Your story is too long when it's no longer working for the person you're talking to. When it's no longer adding value to the person you're talking to, it's too long. And the answer is you don't know that until they <laughs> until they start looking away yeah, and getting impatient. Um, okay, guys, we're nearly on the hour. So if anybody has, thank you all very much for joining. If anybody else has any questions or or quick, like quick last questions, um, Kerry has very kindly promised to do the the the, the homework. Um, I'll post this chat onto the Slack channel um, so that you can all see if you want to go back to it or share it with other people. And as soon as Kerry's rewritten that SEAT case study, uh, we will post that on the same Slack channel so you can, and I'll also stick it on the same Miro so you can see the before and after. And just as a heads up to people is I'm actually joining you from my holiday. I'm that engaged and in, and willing to do this. However, I will be having my holiday after this lovely call. So um, yes, so I've got two, another two and a half weeks and then I should be on to my homework, I promise folks. So just so the, to give people some expectations. I'm going to put a little diary note in my diary. <laughs> time that says yeah nudge kelly um, just, <laughs> just just to make sure that she does do it but listen can we everyone who's left on the call can we just do a big thank you to kerry because she, she she's got to put herself out there to be torn to pieces yeah <laughs> really appreciate it kerry because without without yeah without material to work on it's very hard to give people advice on storytelling in general so thank you very much um thank you also to Bryony for chairing and monitoring everything making sure i recorded it um, <laughs> And uh, Slack channel. Oh, Kerry, have you got a chance? Uh, sorry, Bryony, have you got a chance? Yes, Ke Kerry shared it for me. Hey, lovely. Um, brilliant. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, everybody. I'm going to stop recording. Hold on. <laughs>